Pull the lever, Crunk. <laughs> Tales from the Blue Fairy Book. My microphone seems fairly loud. But hey, that's what happens when you are a scuff streamer. Okay. Let me go ahead and give me a pin message. there. Okay. You have to click it three different places to get rid of that stupid message. Okay. I thought people go live about the same time I do. I guess it just means it's a good time to be live, I guess. But hey. I'm live. <sighs> Let's make sure I am letting people know I'm live because, you know, it's nice to have an audience. Even if I am performing to an audience of myself, which is often the case, but hey, occasionally people do come in. So I make sure that it's known on the Twitters that I'm on. Mm -hmm. I'd change my setup arrangement's a little, so I'll be looking at my camera and it'll be a little bit closer to me looking at the screen so I can watch chat better. But again, it's me shifting focus from... Being able to look at the book itself to... Looking at the computer screen a few inches away. Well, about a foot of well, the computer screen is about you know, two and a half feet to two and a half feet away from me. But my camera is focused closer to where the chat is, so I'll try to be able to look a little bit better at it. Let's see. Down there. Might as well put it on Discord. Not that. Uh, I don't even want to think about Discord. Okay. 
So, hope everyone's having a good evening. Hope that everyone had a good week, since it is finally Friday. And hopefully it's been a good week anyway, because, well, we have a little over two weeks until Christmas. Which means other holidays should be popping up pretty soon, too. I... Not big on celebrating a lot. Uh, my family doesn't even celebrate Christmas on Christmas. They celebrate it uh, both on Thanksgiving when it used to be one part of the family and then we'd have to have Christmas with the other part. Now we just do Christmas with one side of the family then and we do more locally on Christmas Eve. And we open all our presents on Christmas Eve because as you know, the big guy in the red suit shows up then. So that's actually the night he does his deliveries. And then we which don't do anything else. And like on Christmas, we go over and see if there's anything left, and we tend to eat leftovers then. But I will be having, well, I'm working. If you haven't seen my Twitter post about it, I'm working on a playlists that I can just post for stream on Christmas Eve. I may be working on another project in the same time, but I'd rather that be a little bit more of a surprise. But again, it may be something I do Christmas or Christmas Eve or so. Maybe the day before. I don't know. Because it's a surprise, it's kind of surprising that I'm doing it. <laughs> but anyway, I do like celebrating holidays in general. I've got friends that celebrate most of the holidays. Uh, if I had a fireplace, I'd probably do Yule too, but I don't. I do have a fire pit, but I have not assembled it because, well, kind of lazy. But anyway, tonight we are back into the fairy tales, which means we will be cracking open the blue fairy book. We're probably about two-thirds of the way through the book, and I will be posting the entire reading on YouTube afterwards. I do try to hi <clears throat> excuse me. I do try to highlight the reading section. If they're individual stories, I will try to cut it down to the individual stories, but that doesn't always work out very well. But considering there's lots of story times on there, I, I've read over 300 hours of stories now. Can you believe that? 300 hours of me reading stories to people. And that's not even counting gameplay, because gameplay, on well, my total... Let me see what my total runtime is, because I'm kind of amazed by the fact that I've done it this much. Uh, overview. What is my overview? And that is not what I was looking for. Where is it? Okay. Uh, I have streamed 734 hours. That's a lot. That's reading. That's the... I think I've shown maybe five or six movies, maybe a little bit more, but even then, that's only an hour and two, two, two and a half. And seven, I've played a few games. I usually do up to two and a half to five hours, depending on how much time I lose track of playing the game. But all the rest of that has been reading. That is freaking crazy to me. But... That's what I like doing, and I intend to continue doing it. I am looking for the essential day job, because, well, Wolf's got to eat. Hey, cat. But, um, so far, I'm not too sure how that's going. I would love to make affiliates, just so I could, you know, get 
paid for doing something I actually enjoy doing as opposed to sales. But, you know, I'm trying. It's not succeeding on any route, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop. I haven't gotten to that point yet. I did break down after my Werewolf the Apocalypse stream. Luckily, I had one of you come in to actually do answers with me, because I'd really hoped for a lot more, and I was thinking, I was worried about having to pull, run polls to get answers and everything else. But having one person do the answers did make it a lot easier. But I would love to have more of you show up. I have a poll running on Twitter right now on whether or not I continue that story. And only four people have voted so far. Three of them said yes, one said no. If those three people show up when I do it, if and when I do it, it would be nice. But we are ten minutes in, so let's get over to the reading screen, shall we? And blue. And we are in the well. This is technically the library section of the den. It's not so much the study because that's what I'm doing the you know Christmas reads from. But anyway. Tonight's first story is The Wonderful Sheep. Hopefully it's not a bad one. Ignore the puns, if you can. Once upon a time, in the days when the fairies lived, there was a king who had three daughters, who were all young and clever and beautiful. But the youngest of the three, who was called Miranda, was the prettiest and the most beloved. Her the, uh, the king, her father, gave her more dresses and jewels in months than he gave the others in a year. But she was so generous that she shared everything with her sisters, and they were all as happy and as fond of one another as they could be. Now, the king had some quarrelsome neighbors, who, tired of leaving him in peace, began to make war upon him so fiercely that he feared he would be altogether beaten if he did not make an effort to defend himself. Duh. So he collected a great army and set off to fight them, leaving the princesses with their governess in the castle, where news of the war was brought every day. Sometimes that the king had taken a town or won a battle, and at last that he had altogether overcome his enemies and chased them out of his kingdom and was coming back to the castle as quickly as possible to see his dear little Miranda, whom he loved so much. The three princesses put on dresses of satin, which they had made on purpose for a great occasion, one green, one blue, and the third white. Their jewels were the same colors. The eldest wore emeralds, the second turquoise, And the youngest, diamonds. And thus adorned, they went to meet the king, singing verses which they had composed about his victories. Oh, please don't make me sing in this story. When he saw them all so beautiful and so gay, he embraced them tenderly, but gave Miranda more kisses than the others. Favoritism. Presently, a splendid banquet was served, and the king and his daughters sat down to it, 
and as always, he thought that there was something special meaning in everything. He said to his eldest, Tell me, why have you chosen a green dress? Sire, she answered, having heard of your vir victories, I thought green would signify my joy and the hope of your speedy return. That is a very good answer, said the king. And you, my daughter, he continued, why did you take the blue dress? Sire, said the princess, to show that we constantly hoped for your success and that the sight of you is as welcome to me as the sky is with its beautiful stars. Okay. Why, said the king, your wise answers astonish me. And you, Miranda, what made you dress yourself all in white? Because, sire, she answered, white suits me better than anything else. What? said the king angrily. Was that all you thought of, vain child? I, th I thought you would be pleased with me, said the princess. That was all. The king, who loved her, uh, was satisfied with this, and even pretended to be pleased that she had not told him all her reasons at first. And now, he said, as I have supped well, it is now time to get to go to bed. Tell me what you dreamed last night. The eldest said she had dreamed that he brought her a dress, and the precious stones and gold embroidery on it were brighter than the sun. The dream of the second was that the king had brought her a spinning wheel and a distaff, that she might spin him some shirts. But the youngest said, I dreamed that my second sister was to be married, and on her wedding day, you, father, held a golden ewer and said, Come, Miranda, and I will hold that water that you may drip your hands in it. The king was very angry indeed when he heard this dream, and frowned horribly. Indeed, he made such an ugly face that everyone knew how angry he was. And he got up and went off to bed in a great hurry. But he could not forget his daughter's dream. Cat, I don't know what to hold you right now. Go. Does the proud girl wish to make me her slave? He said to himself. I am not surprised at her choosing to dress herself in white satin without the thought of me. She does not think me worthy of her consideration. <sighs> but I will soon put an end to her pretensions. He rose in a fury, and although it was not yet daylight, he sent for the captain of his bodyguard and said to him, you have heard the Princess Miranda's dream. I consider what it means strange things against me. Therefore, I order you to take her away into the forest and kill her. And, that I may be sure it is done, you must bring me her heart and her tongue. If you attempt to deceive me, you shall be put to death. The captain of the guard was very much astonished when he heard this barbarous order. But he did not dare to contradict the king for fear of making him still more angry. Or causing him to send someone else. So he answered that he would fetch the princess and do as the king had said. When he went to her room, they could hardly let him in. It was so early, but he said that it, he, the king had sent for Miranda. And she got up quickly and came out. A little black girl named Patty Pata held up her train and her pet monkey and her little dog ran after her. The monkey was called Grabudgeon and the little dog Tintin. If they name them, they're likely to be important. Take notes. 
The captain of the guard begged Miranda to come down into the garden, where the king was enjoying the fresh air. And when they got there, he pretended to search for him. But as he was not to be found, he said, No doubt your majesty has strolled into the forest. And he opened the little door that led to it, and they went through. By this time, the daylight had begun to appear, and the princess, looking at her conductor, saw that he had tears in his eyes, and that he seemed too sad to speak. "'What is the matter?' she said in the kindest way. "'You seem very sorrowful.' "'Alas, princess,' he answered. "'Who would not be sorrowful who was ordered to do such a terrible thing as I am? "'The king has commanded me to kill you here, and to carry your heart and your tongue to him. "'And if I disobey, I shall lose my life.' The poor princess was terrified. She grew very pale and began to cry softly. Looking up at the captain of the guard with her beautiful eyes, she said gently, Will you really have the heart to kill me? I have never done you any harm, and have only spoken well of you to the king. If I had deserved my father's anger, I would suffer without murder. But alas... He is unjust to complain of me, when I have always treated him with love and respect. For nothing, princess, said the captain of the guard. I would far rather die myself than hurt you, but even if I am killed, you will not be safe. We must find some way of making the king believe that you are dead. What can we do? said Miranda. Unless you take in my heart and my tongue, he will never believe you. The princess and the captain of the guard were talking so earnestly that they did not think of Patipata. But she had overheard all they said, and now came and threw herself at Miranda's feet. Madam, she said, I offer you my life. Let me be killed. I shall be only too happy to die for such a kind mistress. Why, Patipata, cried the princess, kissing her. That would never do. Your life is as precious to me as my own, especially after such a proof of your affection as you have just given me. You are right, princess, said Crab Benjamin, coming forward. To love such a faithful slave as Patty Pella, she is of more use to you than I am. I offer my tongue and my heart most willfully. Especially as if I wish to make a great name for myself in the Goblin Land. No, no, my little Catron, replied Miranda. I cannot bear the thought of taking your life. Such a good little dog I am, said cried Tintin. Could not think of letting either of you die to my mistress. If anyone is to die for her, it must be me. And then began the great disputes between Patty Paya, Grabudgeon, and Tintin. And they came to high words, until at last Grabudgeon, who was quicker than the others, ran up to the very top of the nearest tree and let herself fall head first to the ground. And there she lay, quite dead. The princess was very sorry, but as Grabudgeon was really dead, she allowed the captain of the guard to take her tongue. But alas, it was such a little one, not bigger than the princess's thumb, that they decided surfly that it was of no use at all. The king would not have mistaken it by its for a moment. Alas, my poor little monkey, cried the princess. I have lost you, and yet I am no better off than I was before. The honor of saving your life is to be mine, interrupted Patty Peta. And before they could prevent her, she had picked up the knife and cut her head off in an instant. Wow.
But when the captain of the guard would have taken the tongue, it turned out to be quite black, so that none would have it would not have deceived the king either. It's not how that works. Am I not unlucky? cried the poor princess. I lose everything I love, and I'm none the better for it. If you had accepted my offer, said Tintin, you would only have had to me to regret, and I should have had all your gratitude. Miranda kissed her little dog, crying so bitterly, that at last she could bear it no longer and turned away into the forest. When she looked back, the captain of the guard was gone, and she was alone, except for Patipaya, Grabudjum, and Tintin, who lay upon the ground. She could not leave the place until she had buried them in a pretty little mossy grave at the foot of a tree, and she wrote their names upon the bark of the tree, and how they had all died to save her life. And then she began to think where she could go for safety, for this forest was so close to her father's castle that she might be seen and recognized by the first passer-by, and besides that, it was full of lions and wolves who would have snapped up a princess as soon as they would have stirred chicken. Not true. So she began to walk as fast as she could, but the forest was so large, and the sun was so hot that she nearly died of heat and, and fatigue and terror. Look which way she would, there seemed to be no end of the forest. And she was so frightened that she fancied every minute that she heard the king running after her to kill her. You may imagine how miserable she was, and how she cried as she went on, not knowing which path to follow, and with the thorny bushes scratching her dreadfully and tearing her pretty frock to pieces. At last she heard the bleating of a sheep, and said to herself, no doubt there are shepherds here with their flocks. They will show me the way to some village where I can live disguised as a peasant girl. Alas, it is not always kings and princes who are the happiest in the world. Who could have believed that I should ever be obliged to run away and hide because this king, for no reason at all, wishes to kill me? Yeah. So, saying, she advanced towards the place where she heard the bleeding. But what was her surprise when, in a lovely little glade, quite surrounded by trees, she saw a large sheep. Its wool was white as snow, and its horns shone like gold. It had a garland of flowers around its neck, and strings of great pearls about its legs, and a collar of diamonds. It lay upon a bank of orange flowers under a canopy of cloth of gold which protected it from the heat of the sun. Nearly a hundred other sheep were scattered about, not eating the grass, but some drinking coffee, lemonade, or sherbet. Others eating ices, strawberries and cream, or sweetmeats, while others again were playing games. Many of them wore golden collars with jewels, flowers, and ribbons. Miranda stopped short in amazement at this unexpected sight, and was looking in all directions for the shepherd of this surprising flock, when the beautiful sheep came bounding towards her. Approach, lovely princess, he cried. Have no fear of such gentle and peaceable animals as we are. Oh, I'm speaking sheepish now. What a marvel, cried the princess, starting to back a little. Here is a sheep that can talk. Your monkey and your dog talk, madam, he said. Are you more astonished at us than at them? A fairy gave them the power to speak, replied Miranda. So I was used to them. Perhaps the same thing has happened to us, 
he said, smiling sheepishly. But, princess, what can have led you here? A thousand misfortunes, Mr. Sheep, she answered. I am the unhappiest princess in the world, and I am seeking a shelter against my father's anger. Come with me, madam, said the sheep. I offer you a hiding place which you only will know of, and where you will be mistress of everything you see. I cannot follow you, said Miranda, for I am too tired to walk another step. The sheep with the golden horns ordered that his chariots should be fetched, and in a moment after prepared six goats harnessed to a pumpkin, which was you know, so big that two people could quite sit well in it and it was lined with cushions of velvet and down. The princess stepped into it, much amused at such a new kind of carriage. And the king of the sheep took his place beside her, and the goats ran away with them at full speed, and only stopped when they reached a cavern, the entrance to which was blocked by a great stone. And he invited the princess to enter without fear. Okay, miss one. The king touched with his foot, and the, man, the stone immediately fell down, and he invited the princess to enter without fear. Very good. Now, if she had not been so alarmed by everything that had happened, nothing could have induced her to go into this frightening cave. But she was so afraid of what might be behind her that she would have thrown herself down a well at this moment. So, without hesitation, she followed the sheep, who went before her, down, 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 until she thought they must come out on the other side of the world. Indeed, she was not sure what he wasn't leading her into fairyland. At last, she saw before her a great plain, quite covered with all sorts of flowers, the scent of which seems to be nicer than anything she had ever smelled before. A broad river of orange flower water flowed around it, and fountains of wine of every kind ran in all directions, and made the prettiest little cascades and brooks. The plain was covered with the strangest trees, and there were whole avenues where partridges, ready roasted, hung from every branch or, if you preferred pheasants, quails, turkeys, or rabbits. One second. Get my bottle over. Mm -hmm. Or rabbits. You had only to turn to the right hand or to the left, and you were sure to find them. In places, the air was darkened by showers of lobster patties, white puddings, sausages, tarts, and all other sort of sweetmeats. This is making me hungry. <laughs> or with pieces of gold and silver, diamonds and pearls. This unusual kind of rain had the pleasantness of the whole place, would no doubt have attracted numbers of people to it. If the king of the sheep had been more of a sociable disposition, but from all accounts it is evidence that he was a grave he was as grave as a judge. It, as it was quite the nicest time of the year when Miranda arrived in this delightful land, the only palace she saw was a long row of white of orange trees, jasmines, honeysuckles, and musk roses, and their interlacing branches made the prettiest rooms possible, which were hung with gold and silver gauze, and had great mirrors and candlesticks, and most beautiful pictures. The wonderful sheep begged that the princess would consider herself queen over all that she saw, 
and assured her, though for some years he had been very sad and in great trouble, she had it in her power to make him forget all his grief. "'You are so kind and generous, noble sheep,' said the princess, "'that I cannot thank you enough, but I must confess that all I see here seems to me so extraordinary that I don't know what to think of it.' As she spoke, a band of lovely fairies came up and offered her an amber baskets full of fruits. But when she held out her hands to them, they glided away. And she could feel nothing when she tried to touch them. Oh, she cried, what can they be? Who am I with? And she began to cry. At this time, <sighs> the king of the sheep came back to her and was so distracted to find her in tears that he could have torn his wool. What's the matter, lovely princess? he asked. Has anyone tried to treat you with due respect? Oh, no, said Miranda. Only I am not used to living with sprites and with sheep that talk, and everything here frightens me. It was very kind of you to bring me to this place, but I shall even be more grateful to you if you would take me up into the real world again. Do not be afraid, said the wonderful sheep. I entreat you to have patience and listen to the story of my misfortunes. I was once a king, and my kingdom was the most splendid in the world. My subjects loved me, my neighbors envied me and feared me. I was respected by everyone, and it was said that no king ever deserved it more. <clears throat> I was very fond of hunting, and one day, while chasing a stag, I left my attendants far behind. Suddenly I saw an animal leap into a pool of water. As I rashly urged my horse to follow it, but before we had gone many steps, I felt an extraordinary heat instead of the coolness of the water. The pond dried up. A great gulf opened before me, out of which flames of fire shot up, and I felt helplessly to the bottom of the precipice. I gave myself up for lost, but presently a voice said, Ungrateful prince, even this fire is hardly enough to warm your cold heart. Who complains of my coldness in this dismal place? I cried. An unhappy being who loves you helplessly, replied. Replied the voice, and in the same moment the flames began to flicker and ceased to burn. And I saw a fairy, whom I had known as long as I could remember, and whose ugliness had always horrified me. She was leaning upon the arm of a most beautiful young girl, who wore chains of gold on her wrists, and was evidently her slave. Why, Ragaret, I said, for that was the fairy's name. What is the meaning of all this? Is it by your orders that I am here? <clears throat> and whose thought is that? She answered. That you never understood me until now? Must a powerful fairy like myself consent to explain her doings to you, who are no better than an ant by comparison, though you think yourself a great king? <laughs> Tell me what you like, I said impatiently. But what is it you want, my crown, or my cities, or my treasures? Treasures, said the fairy disdainfully. 
If I could choose, I could make any one of your r scullions richer and more powerful than you. I do not want your treasures, but... She had it softly. If you give me your heart, if you will marry me, I will add twenty kingdoms to the one you already have. You shall have a hundred castles full of gold and five hundred full of silver. And, in short, anything you'd like to ask me for. Madam Ragot, said I, when one is at the bottom of a pit where one has fully expected to be roasted alive, it is impossible to think of asking such a person. Charming persons as you are to marry one. I beg that you will set me in my liberty, and that I will hope to answer your question fittingly. Ah, said she, if you really loved me, you would not care where you were. A cave, a wood, a foxhole, a desert. Would you please eat you as well? Do not think that you can deceive me. You fancy you are going to escape. But I assure you that you are going to stay here, and the first thing I shall give you to do will be to keep my sheep. And they are very good company and speak quite as well as you do. As she spoke, she advanced and led me to this plain where we stand now, and showed me her flock. But I paid little attention to it or to her, to tell the truth. I was so lost in admiration of her beautiful slave that I forgot everything else. And the cruel regard perceived this and turned upon her so furiously and terribly that I look and life she fell lifeless to the ground. At this dreadful sight, I drew my sword and rushed Regus, and should certainly have cut off her head, and she did not, by her magic arts, chained me to the spot on which I stood. All my efforts to move were we, and at last I went through my own down to the ground in despair. She said to me with scornful voice, I intend to make you feel my power. It seems that you are not a lion at present. I mean you to be a sheep. <clears throat> so saying, she touched me with her wand, and I became what you see. I did not lose the power of speech, or the feeling of misery for my present state. <clears throat> For five years. No. For five years, she said. You shall be a sheep and lord of this pleasant land. While I no longer am able to see your face, which I love so much, shall be better able to hate you as you deserve to be hated. The dog-king sheep received me as their king and told me that they were, too, were unfortunate princes who had, in different ways, offended the vengeful fairy. <clears throat> and had added to their flock for a certain number of years, some more, some less. For some time, indeed, one regains his own proper form and goes back again to this place in the upper world. But the other beings who you saw are the rivals, or the enemies of Ragut, <clears throat> whom she has imprisoned here for hundreds of years, though even they go and come back at least. <clears throat> the young slave of whom I told you about is one of these. I have seen her often, and it has been a great pleasure to see. She never speaks to me. But if I am smeared to her, I know I should be able to find her only a shadow, which would be very annoying. <coughs> That's his voice. However, I noticed that one of my companions was misfortune enough to also be very attentive of this sprite. And I found out 
that he had been her lover, whom the cruel regret had taken away from her long before. Since then I have cared for and thought of nothing but how I might regain my freedom. I have often been in the forest. That is where I have seen you, lovely princess. Sometimes driving your chariot, which you did with all the grace and skill of the world. Sometimes riding to the chase with a spirited horse, and it seemed to have the one that yourself could have managed it. <clears throat> and sometimes running races on the plain with the princesses of the court. Running so lightly that it was you always who won the prize. Oh, princess, I have loved you for so long, and yet now I dare tell you of my love. What hope is there for an unhappy she like myself? <clears throat> Miranda, who was surprised and confused by all that she had heard, that she hardly knew what to answer to give to the king of sheep, but she managed to make some kind of little speech, which certainly did not forbid him to hope, and she said that she w should not be afraid of the shadows now, and she knew that they would co be some day to come to life again. Alas, she continued, if my poor Peripata, my dear Gabriel, my little Tintin, all who died for my sake were equally well off. I should have nothing left to wish for here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. said to his master of the horse. Go and seek the shadows of the little black girl, the monkey, and the dog. They will amuse our princess. <clears throat> After an instant afterwards, Miranda saw them coming toward her, and their presence gave her the greatest pleasure, though they did not come near enough for her to touch them. The king of sheep was so kind and amusing, and loved Miranda so dearly, that at last she began to love him too. Such a handsome sheep, who was so polite and considerate, could hardly fail to please, especially if one knew that he was really a king, and that his strange imprisonment would soon come to an end. So, the princess's days passed very gaily while she waited for the happy time to come. The king of the sheep, with the help of all the flock, got up balls, concerts, and hunting parties, and even the shadows joined in to howl the fun, and came, making believe to be their own real selves. One evening when the couriers arrived, for the king sent most carefully for news, and they always brought the very best kinds, it was announced that the sister of the Princess Miranda was going to be married to a great prince, and that nothing could be more splendid than all the preparations for the wedding. Ah, cried the hint princess, how unluck I am to miss the sight of so many pretty things. Here I am imprisoned under the earth with no company but sheep and shadows, while my sister is to be adorned like a queen and surrounded by all who love and admire her, and everyone but myself can go to wish her joy. Why do you complain, princess? said the king of the sheep. Did I say that you were not to go to the wedding? Set out as soon as you please. Only promise me that you will come back, for I love you too much to be able to live without you. Miranda was very grateful to him, and promised faithfully that nothing in the world should keep her from coming back. The king caused an escort suitable to her rank to be got ready for her, and she dressed splendidly, not forgetting anything that would make her look more beautiful. Her chariot was another, was a mother of pearl, drawn by six dun-colored griffins just brought from the other side of the world. 
and she was attended by a number of guards in splendid uniforms, who were all at least eight feet high, and had come from afar and near to ride by the princess's side. Miranda reached her father's palace just as the wedding ceremony began, and everyone, as soon as she came in, was struck by surprise at her beauty and splendor of her jewels. She heard exclamations of admiration on all sides, and the king, her father, looked at her so attentively that she was afraid he must recognize her. But he was so sure that she was dead that the idea never occurred to him. However, the fear of not getting away made her leave before the marriage was over. She went so hastily, leaving behind her little coral casket set with emeralds. On it was written the diamond letters, Jewels for the Bride. And when they opened it, which they did as soon as they found it, there seemed to be no end of pretty things it contained. The king, who had hoped to join the unknown princess and find out who she was, was dreadfully disappointed when she disappeared so suddenly, and gave orders that if she ever came again, the doors were to be shut, and that she might not get away so easily. Short as Miranda's absence had been, it had seemed like a hundred years to the king of the sheep. He was waiting for her by the fountain in the thickest part of the forest, and the ground was strewn with splendid presents which he had prepared for her to show his joy and gratitude at her coming back. As soon as she was in sight, he rushed to meet her, leaping and bounding like a real sheep. He caressed her tenderly, throwing himself at her feet and kissing her hands, and told her how uneasy he had been in her absence, and how impatient for her return, with an eloquence which charmed her. After some time, news that the king's second daughter was going to be married. When Miranda heard it, she begged the king of sheep to allow her to go, and see the wedding as before. The request made him feel very sad, as if some misfortune would surely come of it. But his love for the princess being stronger than anything else, he did not like to refuse her. "'You wish to leave me, princess?' said he. "'It is my unhappy fate. You are not to blame. I can sense you are going to leave me. I can give you no stronger proof of my love than by doing so.' The princess assured him that she would only stay a very short time, as she had done before, and begged him not to be uneasy, as she would be quite as grieved if anything detained her as he could possibly be. So, with the same escort, she set out, and reached the palace as the marriage ceremony began. Everybody was delighted to see her, she was so pretty that they thought she must be some fairy princess, and the princes who were there could not take their eyes off of her. The king was more glad than anyone else that she had come again, and gave orders that the doors should all be shut and bolted that very minute. When the wedding was all but over, the princess got up quickly, hoping to slip away unnoticed among the crowd, but to her great dismay... She found every door fastened. She felt more at ease when the king came up to her, and with the greatest respect, begged her not to run away so soon, but at least to honor him by staying for the splendid feast which was prepared for the princes and princesses. He led her into the magnificent hall, where all the court was assembled, and himself taking up the golden bowl full of water, he offered it to her that she might dip her pretty fingers into it. My dream has come true after all. You have offered me the water to wash my hands on my sister's wedding day, and it has not vexed you to do it. The king recognized her at once. Indeed, he had already thought several times how much like his poor little Miranda she was. Oh, my dear daughter, he cried, kissing her. Can you ever forget my cruelty? I ordered you to be put to death because I thought your dream pretended the loss of my crown. And so it did, he added. 
For now your sisters are both married and have kingdoms of their own, and mine shall be for you. So saying, he put his crown on the princess's head and cried, Long live Queen Miranda! All the court cried, Long live Queen Miranda! After him, and the young queen's two sisters came running up, and threw their arms around her neck, and kissed her a thousand times, and then there was such a laughing and crying, talking and kissing all at once. And Miranda thanked her father and began to ask after everyone, particularly the captain of the guard, to whom she owed so much. But, to her great sorrow, she heard that he was dead. Presently they sat down to the banquet, and the king asked Miranda to tell them all that had happened to her since the terrible morning when he had sent for the captain of the guard to fetch her. She did with so much spirit that all the guests listened with breathless interest. But while she was thus enjoying herself with the king and her sisters, the king of the sheep was waiting impatiently for the time of her return. When it came and went, and no princess appeared, his anxiety became so great that he could bear it no longer. She's not coming back anymore, he cried. My miserable sheep's face displeases her, and without Miranda, what is left of me? Wretched creature that I am! Oh, cruel my God, my punishment is not complete! For a long time he bewailed his sad fate like this, and then, seeing that it was growing dark, and that still no sign of the princess, he set out as fast as he could in the direction of the town. When he reached the palace, he asked for Miranda, but by this time everyone had heard the story of her adventures, and did not want her to go back to the king of the sheep, so they refused sternly to let him in to see her. In vain he begged and prayed them to let him in. Though his entreaties might have melted hearts of stone, they did not move the guards of the palace. And at last, quite broken-hearted, he fell dead at their feet. In the meantime, the king, who had not the least idea of the sad thing that was happening outside the gate of his palace, proposed to Miranda that she should be given her chariot all the, round the town, which was to be illuminated with thousands and thousands of torches, placed in windows and balconies, and in all grand squares. But what a sight met her eyes at the very entrance of the palace. There lay her dear, kind sheep, silent and motionless upon the pavement. She threw herself out of the chariot and ran to him, crying bitterly, for she realized that her prom broken promise had cost him his life, and for a long, long time she was so unhappy that they thought she would have died too. You see, even a princess is not always happy, especially if she forgets to keep her word, and the greatest misfortunes often happen to people just as they think that they have obtained their heart's desires. Keep your words, princesses. Stay honest, cubs. You never know what damages your lies can do or forgotten promises. Hmm. Now here seems to be another story that is vaguely familiar. The Forty Thieves. No sheep in this one. In a town in Persia there dwelt two brothers, one named Kasim and the other Ali Baba. Kasim was married to his rich wife and lived in plenty, while Ali Baba had to maintain his wife and children by cutting wood in a neighboring forest and sowing it in the town. One day, when Ali Baba was in the forest, he saw a troop of men on horseback coming toward him in a cloud of dust. He was afraid that they were robbers and climbed up into a tree for safety. When they came up on him and dismounted, 
He counted forty of them. They unbridled their horses and tied them to trees. The finest man among them, whom Ali Baba took to be their captain, went a little way among the bushes and said, Open sesame. So plainly that Ali Baba heard him. A door opened in the rocks, and having made the troop go in, he followed them, and the door again shut itself. They stayed there for some time, and Ali Baba, fearing that they might come out and catch him, was forced to sit patiently in the tree. At last the door opened again, and the forty thieves came out. As the captain went in the last, he came out first, and made them all pass him. Then he closed the door, saying, Shut, Sesame! Every man bridled his horse and mounted, and the captain put himself at their head, and they returned as they came. Then Ali Baba climbed down and went to the door concealed by the bushes and said, Open sesame! And it flew open. Ali Baba, who expected a dull, dismal place, was greatly surprised to find it large and well-lighted, hollowed by the hand of man in the form of a vault, which received the light from the opening in the ceiling. He saw rich bales of merchandise, silk, stuffed brocades, all piled together, and gold and silver in heaps, and money in leather purses. He went in, and the door shut behind him. He did not look at the silver, but brought out as many bags of gold as he thought it, his asses, which were browsing outside, could carry, loaded them with the bags, and hid all with the faggots. Using the words, shut sesame, he closed the door and went home. Then he drove his asses into the yard, shut the gates, and carried the money bags to his wife, and emptied them out before her. He bade her keep the secrets, and he would go and bury the gold. Let me measure it first, said his wife. I will borrow a measure of someone while you dig the hole. So she ran to the wife of Kasim and borrowed the measure. Knowing Alibaba's poverty, the sister was curious to find out what sort of grain his wife wished to measure, and artfully put some sweat in the bottom of the measure. Alibaba's wife went home and set the measure at the heap of gold, and filled it and emptied it to her great content, then carried it back to her sister without noticing that a piece of gold was sticking to it which Kasim's wife received directly, and her back was turned. She grew very curious, and said to Kasim when he came home, Kasim, your brother is richer than you. He does not count his money, he measures it. He begged her to explain this riddle, which she did by showing him the piece of money, and telling him where she found it. When Kasim grew so envious that he could not sleep, he went to his brother in the morning before sunrise. Ali Baba, he said, shouting, showing him the gold piece, you pretend to be poor, and yet you measure gold? By this, Ali Baba perceived through his wife's folly, Kasim and his wife knew their secrets. So he confessed all, and offered Kasim a share. That I expect, said Kasim. But I must know where to find the treasure, otherwise I will discover all, and you will lose all. Ali Baba, more out of kindness than fear, told him of the cave and the very words to use. Kasim left Ali Baba, meaning to be beforehand with him, and get the treasure himself. He rose early the next morning and set out with ten mules loaded with great chests. As soon as he found the place and the door in the rock, he said, Open sesame! And the door opened and shut behind him. He could have feasted his eyes all day on the treasures, but he now hastened to gather together as much of it as possible. But when he was ready, he could not remember to say the words to open the door. Instead of sesame, he said, Open barley! And the door remained fast. He named several other sorts of grain, all but the right one, and the door still stuck fast. 
So he was frightened at the danger he was in, and that he had much forgotten the word, as if he had never heard it. About noon, the robbers returned to the cave, and saw Kasim's mules roving about with great chests on their backs. This gave them the alarm, and they drew their sabers and went to the door, which opened on their captains, saying, Open sesame! Kasim, who had heard the trampling of the horse's feet, resolved to sell his life dearly. So when the door opened, he leapt out and threw the captain down. In vain, however, for the robbers with their sabers soon killed him. <clears throat> On entering the cave, they saw all the bags already laid, and could not imagine how anyone had got in without knowing their secrets. They cut Kasim's body into four quarters, and nailed them up inside the cave, in order to frighten anyone who should venture in, and went away in search of more treasure. As night drew on, Kasim's wife grew very uneasy, and ran to her brother-in-law and told him where her husband had gone. Ali Baba did not his best to comfort her, and set out in the forest to search of Kasim. The first thing he saw on entering the cave was his dead brother. Full of horror, he put the body in one of his asses and the bags of gold on the other two, and covering all with some faggots, returned home. He drove the two asses laden with gold into his yard and led the other to Kasim's house. The door was opened by the slave Morgana, whom he knew to be both brave and cunning. Unloading his ass, he said to her, This is the body of your master who has been murdered, but whom we must bury as though he died in his bed. I will speak with you again, but now tell your mistress I can come. The wife of Kasim, on learning the fate of her husband, broke out into cries and tears. But Ali Baba offered to take her to live with him and his wife if she would promise to keep his counsel and leave everything to Morgiana, whereupon she entered and dried her eyes. Morgiana, meanwhile, sought an apothecary and asked him for some lozenges. My poor master, she said, can neither eat nor speak, and no one knows what his distemper is. She asked some of the just yeah, some of the lozenges and returned the next day weeping for an essence only given to those just about to die. Thus, in the evening, no one was surprised to hear her wretched shrieks and cries of Cassim's wife and Morgiana, telling everyone that Cassim was dead. The next day, Morgiana went to an old cobbler near the gates of town and opened his stall early, put a piece of gold in his hand, and bade him follow her with his needle and thread. Having bound his eyes with a handkerchief, she took him to the room where the body laid, pulled off the bandage, and bade him sew the quarters together, after which she covered his eyes again and led him home. Then they buried Kasim, and Morgiana and his slave followed him to the grave, weeping and tearing her hair, while Kasim's wife stayed at home, utterly lamentable cries. Next day she went in to live with Alibaba, who gave Kasim's shop to his eldest son. The forty thieves, on their return to the cave, were much astonished to find Kasim's body gone, and some of their money bags. We were certainly discovered, cries the captain, and shall be undone if we cannot find out who it is that knows our secrets. Two men must have known it. We have killed one. We must now find the other. To this end, one of you is, who is bold and artful must go into the city dressed as a traveler and discover whom have killed, and whether men talk of a strange manner of his death. If the messenger fails, he must lose his life, lest we be betrayed. One of the thieves started up and offered to do this, and after a rest he had highly commended for his bravery, he disguised himself and happened to enter the town at daybreak, just by Baba Mustafa's stall. The thief bade him good day, saying, Honest man, can you possibly see to stitch at your age? <laughs> Old as I am, replied the cobbler, 
I have very good eyes. And will you believe me when I tell you that I sewed a dead body together in a place where I had less light than I have now? The robber was overjoyed at his good fortune, and giving him a piece of gold, desired to be shown the house where he stitched up the dead body. At first, Mustafa refused, saying that he had been blindfolded. But when the robber gave him another piece of gold, he began to think he might remember the turnings if blindfolded as before. This means succeeded. The robber partly led him and was partly guided by him, right in the front of Cassim's house, the door of which the robber marked with a piece of chalk. Then, well pleased, he bade farewell to Baba Mustafa and returned to the forest. By and by, Morgiana, going out, saw the mark the robber made, quickly guessed that some mischief was brewing, and, fetching a piece of chalk, marked two or three doors on each side without saying anything to her master or mistress. The time, meanwhile, told his comrades... The, the thief, meantime, told his comrades of his discovery. The captain thanked him and bade him show the house he had marked. But when they came to it, they saw that five or six houses were marked with chalk in the same manner. The guide was so confounded that he knew not what answer to make, and when they returned, he was at once beheaded for having failed. Another robber was dispatched, and having won over Baba Mustafa, marked the house with red chalk. But Morgiana, again being too clever for them, the second messenger was put to death also. The captain now resolved to go himself, but wiser than the others, he did not mark the house, but looked closely at it so he could not fail to remember. He returned and ordered his men to go into the neighboring villages and buy nineteen mules and thirty-eight leather jars, all empty except one which was full of oil. The captain put one of his men fully armed into each, rubbing the outside of the jars with oil of the fuel vessel. Then the nineteen mules were loaded with the thirty-seven robbers and jars, and the jar of the oil, and reached the town by dusk. The captain stopped his mules in front of Ali Baba's house, and said to Ali Baba, who was sitting out in the coolness, I have brought some oil from a distance to sell to tomorrow's market, but it is now late, and I know not where to pass the night. Unless you will do me the favor to take me in. Though Ali Baba had seen the captain of the robbers in the forest, he did not recognize him in the disguise of an oil merchant. He bade him welcome and opened his gates for the mules to enter. He went to Morgiana to bid her prepare a bed and supper for his guest. He brought the stranger into his hall, and after they had supped, went again to speak to Morgiana in the kitchen. Well, the captain went into the yard under the pretense of seeing after his mules, but really to tell his men what to do. Beginning at the first jar and ending at the last, he said to each man, As soon as I throw some stones at the window from the chamber where I lie, cut the jars open with your knives and come out, and I will be with you in a trice. He returned to the house, and Morgiana led him to the chamber. She then told... Abadallah, her fellow slave, to set on the pot to make broth for her master, who had gone to bed. Meanwhile, her lamp went out, and she had no more oil in the house. Do not be uneasy, said Abdallah. Go into the yard and take some oil from one of those jars. Morgana thanked, her for, thanked him for his advice, took the oil pot, and went into the yard. When she came out to the first jar, the robber inside said slowly, Is it time? Any other slave but Morgiana, finding a man in a jar instead of oil she wanted, would have screamed and made a noise. But she, <clears throat> knowing the danger her master was in, bethought herself of a plan, and answered quietly, Not yet, but presently. She went to all the jars, giving the same answer, but she came to the jar of oil. 
She now saw that her master, thinking and entertained an oil merchant, now led 38 robbers into his house. She filled her oil pots and went back into the kitchen. And having lit her lamp, she went back out to the oil jar and filled a kettle of oil. When it boiled, she went and poured oil into every jar to stifle and kill the robber inside. When this brave deed was done, she went back to the kitchen, put out the fire and lamp, and waited to see what would happen. Glad you're here. <clears throat> In a quarter of an hour, the captain of the robbers woke, got up, and opened the window. As all seemed quiet, he threw down some little pebbles and hit the jars. He listened, and as none of the men seemed to stir, he grew uneasy and went down into the yard. And going to the first drawer and saying, Are you asleep? He smelt the hot, boiled oil. He knew at once that his plot to murder Ali Baba and his household had been discovered. He found all the gang was dead and missing the oil out of the last jar. Become aware of the manner of their death. He then forced the lock of the door leading to the garden, and climbing over several walls made his escape. Morgiana heard this and saw all this, and, rejoicing at her success, went to bed and fell asleep. At daybreak, Ali Baba arose, and seeing the oil jar still there, he asked why the merchant had gone without his mules. Morgiana bade him look in the first jar and see if they had, there was any oil. Seeing a man, he started back in terror. Have no fear, Morgiana said. That man cannot harm you. He is dead. Ali Baba, when he had recovered somewhat from his astonishment, asked what had become of the merchant. Merchant, she said. He is no more a merchant than I am. And she told him the whole story, assuring him that it was a plot of the robbers of the forest, of whom only three were left, and that the white and red chalks had something to do with it. Ali Baba at once gave Morgiana her freedom, saying that he owed her his life. Then they buried the bodies in Ali Baba's garden, while the mules were sold in markets by his slaves. The captain returned to his lonely cave, which seemed frightening to him without his lost companions, and firmly resolved to avenge them by killing Ali Baba. He addressed himself carefully and went into the town, where he took lodgings at the inn. In the course of many journeys to the forest, he carried away as many rich stuffs and fine linen, and set up shop opposite that of Ali Baba's son. He called himself Kogia Hassan, and as he was both civil and well-dressed, he soon made friends with Ali Baba's son, and through him with Ali Baba, whom he continually asked to sup with him. Ali Baba, wishing to return his kindness, invited him into his house, and receiving him smiling, thanked him for his kindness to his son. When the merchant was about to take his leave, Ali Baba stopped him, saying, where are you going, sir, in such haste? Will you not stay and sup with me? The merchant refused, saying that he had a reason, and on Ali Baba's asking what that was, he replied, It is, sir, that I can eat no victuals that have any salt in them. If that is all, said Ali Baba, let me tell you that there shall be no salt in either the meats or the bread that we shall eat tonight. He went to give this order to Morgiana, who was surprised. Who is this man, she said, who eats no salt with his meat? He is an honest man, Morgiana, returned her master. Therefore, do as I bid you. But she could not withstand the desire to see the strange man, so she helped Abadala carry up the dishes, and saw in a moment that Kogia Hassan was the robber captain, and carried a dagger under his garments. I am not surprised, she said to herself that this wicked man who intends to kill my master will eat no salt with him, but I will hinder his plans. She went to the supper by Abdallah while she made ready for one of the boldest acts that she could have th thought on. 
Well, when dessert had been served, Kogan Hassan was left all alone with Ali Baba and his son, whom he thought to make drunk and then to murder them. Morgiana, meanwhile, put on a headdress like a dancing girl's, and clasped a girdle around her waist, from which she hung a dagger with a silver hilt, and said to Abdullah, Take your tabor, and let us go and divert our master and his guest. Abdullah took his tabor and played before Morgiana, and they came to the door, where Abdullah stopped playing, and Morgiana made a low curtsy. Come in, Morgiana, said Ali Baba, and let Kogia Hassan see what you can do. And turning to Kogia Hassan, he said, She's my slave and my housekeeper. Kogia Hassan was by no means pleased, for he feared that this chance of killing Ali Baba was gone for the present. But he pretended great eagerness to see Morgiana, and Abdallah began to play and Morgiana dance. After she had performed several dances, she drew the dagger and made passes with it, sometimes pointing it at her own breasts, sometimes at her master's, and as if it were part of the dance. Suddenly, out of breath, she snatched the tabor from Abdallah with her left hand, and, holding the dagger with his, her right, held out the tabor to her master, Ali Baba, and said to his son to put a piece of gold into it. And Korge Hassan, seeing that she was coming at him, pulled out his purse to make a present, but while he was putting his hand into it, Morgana plunged her dagger into his heart. Unhappy girl, cried Ali Baba and his son, what have you done to ruin us? It was to preserve you, master, and not to ruin you, answered Morgana. See here, opening the false merchant's garments and showing the dagger. See what an enemy you have entertained. Remember, he would eat no salt with you, and what more would you have? Look at him. He is both the false oil merchant and the captain of the forty thieves. Ali Baba was so grateful to Morgiana that, for saving his life, he offered her to a son in marriage, yeah. who readily consented, and a few days after the wedding was celebrated with the greatest splendor. At the end of a year, Ali Baba, hearing nothing of two remaining robbers, judged they were dead, and set out to the cave. The door opened on a saying, Open Sesame. He went in and saw that nobody had been there since the captain had left it. He brought away as much gold as he could carry, and returned to town. He told his son the secret of the cave, which his son handed down in his turn, so the children and grandchildren of Ali Baba were rich to the end of their lives. Let's see. What time is it? Hour 23. Get a few more stories in. <clears throat> Drink real quick. Okay. The next story is Snow White and Rose Red. A poor widow once lived in a cottage with a garden in front of it, in which grew two rose trees, one bearing white roses and the other red. She had two children who were just like the two rose trees. One was called Snow White and the other Rose Red, and they were the sweetest and best children in the world always diligent and always cheerful, but Snow White was quieter and more gentle than Rose Red. Rose Red loved to run in the fields and meadows and pick flowers and catch butterflies, but Snow White sat at home with her mother and helped her in the household, or read aloud to her when there was no work to do. The two children loved each other so dearly that they always walked about hand in hand whenever they went together, and when Snow White said, 
We will never desert each other, Rose Red answered. No, not as long as we live. And the mother added, Whatever one gets, one she shall share with the other. They often roamed about in the woods, gathering berries, but no beast offered to hurt them. On the contrary, they came up to them almost confidently in manner. A little hare would eat cabbage leaf from their hands. The deer grazed beside them. The stag would bound past them merrily. And the birds remained on the branches and sang to them with all their might. No evil ever befell them. If they tarried late in the wood and night overtook them, they lay down together on the moss and slept till morning, and their mother knew they were quite safe and never felt anxious about them. Once, when they had slept all night in the wood and had been wakened by the morning sun, they perceived a beautiful child in a shining white robe sitting next to the resting place. The figure got up, looked at them kindly, but said nothing, and vanished into the wood. And when they looked around um, about them, they became aware that they had slipped quite close to a precipice, over which they would certainly have fallen had they gone on a few steps further into the darkness. And when they told their mother of their adventure, she said they must have seen an angel that was guarding them in their sleep. Snow White and Rose Red kept their mother's cottage so beautifully clean and neat that it was a pleasure to go into. In summer, Rose Red looked after the house, and every morning before her mother awoke, she placed a bunch of flowers before the bed, and from each tree arose. In winter, Snow White lit the fire and put the kettle on, which was made of gra brass, but so beautifully polished that it shone like gold. In the evening, when the snowflakes fell, their mother said, Snow White, go and close the shutters. And they drew around the fire while the mother put on their spectacles and read aloud from a big book, and the two girls listened and sat and span. Beside them on the ground lay a little lamb. Behind them perched a little white dove with its head tucked under its wing. One evening, as they s sat thus cozily together, someone knocked at the door as though he desired admittance. The mother said, Rose Red, open the door quickly. It must be a traveler seeking shelter. Rose Red hastened to unbar the door and thought she saw a poor man standing in the darkness outside. But there was no such thing, only a bear who poked his black, thick head in through the door. Rose Red screamed aloud and sprang back. The lamb began to bleat. The dove flapped its wings, and the snow white ran and hid behind her mother's bed. But the bear began to speak, and said, Don't be afraid. I won't hurt you. I'm half frozen, and only wish to warm myself a little. My poor bear, said the mother, lie down by the fire and take care not to burn your fur. Then she called out, Snow White and Rose Red, come out. The bear will do you no harm. He is a good and honest creature. So they both came out of their hiding places, and gradually the lamb and the dove drew close too, and then they forgot their fear. The bear asked the children to beat the snow out a little of his fur, and they brushed and scrubbed him until he was dry. The beast stretched himself out in front of the fire, and growled quite happily and comfortably. The children soon grew quite at ease with him, and led their helpless guests to fearful life. They tugged his fur with their hands, put their small feet on his back, and rolled him about here and there, or took a hazel wand and beat him with it. And if he growled, they only laughed. The bear submitted to everything with the best possible good nature. Only when they went too far, he cried, Oh, my children, spare my life. Snow White, Rose Red, don't beat your lover dead. Seriously, that's their song? 
When it was time to retire for the night, and the others went to bed, the mother said to the bear, You can lie there on the hearth. In heaven's name, it will be a shelter for you in the cold and wet. As soon as day dawned, the children let him out, and he trotted over the snow into the wood. From this time on, the bear came every evening at the same hour, and lay down by the hearth, and let the children play what pranks they liked with him. And they got so accustomed to him that the door was never shut till their black friend had made his appearance. When spring came, and all outside was green, the bear said one morning to Snow White, Now I must go away and not return again for the whole summer. Where are you going, dear bear? asked Snow White. I must go to the wood and protect my treasure from the wicked dwarves. In winter, when the earth is frozen hard, they are obliged to remain underground, for they can't work. But now, when the sun has thawed and warmed the ground, they break through and come up above to spy the land and steal what they can. What once falls into their hands and into their caves is not easily brought back to light. Snow White was quite sad over their friend's departure, and when she unbarred the door for him, the bear stepped out caught a piece of his fur on the door knocker, and Snow White thought she caught sight of a glittering gold beneath it, but she couldn't be certain of it, and the bear ran hastily away and soon disappeared behind the trees. A short time after, this sent the mother to the children into the woods to collect faggots. They came in their wanderings upon a big tree that lay felled on the ground, and on the trunk among the long grass they noticed something jumping up and down, but... What it was, they couldn't quite distinguish. When they approached nearer, they perceived a dwarf with a wizened face and a beard a yard long. At the end of the beard was jammed into a cleft of the tree, and the little man sprang about like a dog on a chain, and didn't seem to know what he was to do. He glared at the girls with his fiery eyes and screamed out, What are you standing there for? Can't you come and help me? "'What are you, little man?' asked Rose Red. "'You stupid, inquisitive goose,' replied the dwarf. "'I wanted to split the tree in order to get the little chips of wood for our kitchen fire. "'Those thick logs deserve no fire to make curse. "'Greedy people like yourselves quite burn up all the little wood we need. "'I had successfully driven the wedge, and all was going well. "'Ahem!' <coughs> But the cursed wood was so slippery. That it suddenly sprang out and the tree closed up as rapidly as I'd had time to put my beautiful white beard out. So here I am stuck fast and I can't get away and you silly smooth-faced milk and water girls just stand and laugh. Uh, what ugly wretches you are. The children did all in their power, but they couldn't get the beard out. It was wedged in far too firmly. I will run and fetch someone, said Rose Red. Crazy blockheads, snapped the dwarf. What's the good of calling anyone else? You're already too many for me. There's nothing better to occur to you than that. Don't be so impatient, said Snow White. I'll see you get help. And taking her scissors out of her pockets... She cut off the end of the beard. As soon as the dwarf felt himself free, he seized the bag full of gold which was hidden among the roots of the tree, lifted it up, and muttered loud, Curse these cruel wretches cutting off a piece of my splendid beard! With these words, he swung the bag over his head, and disappeared without so much as looking at the children again. Shortly after this, Snow White and Rose Red went out to get a death dish of fish. As they approached the stream, they saw something which looked like an enormous grasshopper springing toward the water as if it was going to jump in. They ran forward and recognized their old friend, the dwarf. Where are you going to? asked Rose Red. You're surely not going to jump into the water. I'm not such a fool, screamed the dwarf. Don't you see that cursed fish is trying to drag me in? The little man had been sitting on the bank fishing, and was unfortunately the wind had entangled his beard in the line. 
and when immediately after a big fish bit, the feeble little creature had no strength to pull it out, and the fish had an upper fin and dragged the dwarf toward him. <laughs> he clung on with all his might to every rush and blade of grass, but it didn't help him much. He had to follow every movement of the fish, and was in great danger of being drawn into the water. The girls came up just at the right moment, held him firm, and did all they could to disentangle his beard from the line, but in vain. Beard and line were in hopeless muddle. Nothing remained but to produce the scissors and cut the beard, by which a small part of it was sacrificed. When the dwarf perceived what they had done, he yelled, Do you call that manners, you toadstools, to disfigure a fellow's face? It wasn't enough that you shortened my beard before, and now you must needs off the bit of it. I can't appear like this before you own people. I wish you'd just send Jericho first. <clears throat> and he fetched the sack of pearls that lay among the rushes, and without saying another word, he dragged it away and disappeared behind a stone. It happened that soon after this, the mothers sent the two girls to town to buy needles, thread, laces, and ribbons. Their road led over a heath where huge boulders of rock lay scattered here and there. While trudging along, they saw a big bird hovering in the air, circling slowly above them, but always descending lower till at last it settled on a rock not far from them. Immediately after, they heard a sharp, piercing cry. They ran toward and saw the horror that an eagle had pounced on their old friend the dwarf and was about to carry him off. The tender-hearted children seized hold of the little man and struggled so long with the bird that at last he let go of his prey. Then the dwarf had recovered from his first shock. He screamed in his screeching voice, Couldn't you have treated more me more carefully? You have torn within my coat to shreds, useless, awkward hussies that you are. Then he took a bag of precious stones and vanished under the rock into his cave. The girls were accustomed to his ingratitude and went on their way and did their business in town. On their way home, as they were passing the heath, they surprised the dwarf by pouring out his precious stones in an open space for he thought no one would pass it at so late an hour. That evening the sun shone on the glittering stones, and they danced and gleamed so beautifully that the children stood still and gazed on them. "'What are you standing and daping for?' screamed the dwarf. His ashen-gray face became scarlet with rage. He was about to go off with his angry words when a sudden growl was heard, and a black bear trotted out of the wood. The dwarf jumped up in great fright, but he didn't have time to reach his place for retreat, for the bear was already close to him. Then in horror, he cried, Dear Mr. Bear, spare me! I'll give you all my treasure! Look at those beautiful precious stones lying there! Spare my life! What pleasure would you get from a poor feeble little fellow like me? You won't feed me between your teeth! Let... There, lay hold of these two wicked girls. They will be tender morsel for you, as fat as young quails. Eat them up, for heaven's sake. But the bear, paying no attention to his words, gave the little creature one blow with his paw, and he never moved again. The girls had run away, but the bear called after them. Snow White, Rose Red, don't be afraid. Wait, I'll come with you. Then they recognized his voice and stood still, and when the bear was quite close to them, his skin suddenly fell off, and a beautiful man stood beside them, all dressed in gold. I am a king's son, he said, and have been doomed by that unholy little dwarf who had stolen my treasure to roam the woods, a wild bear, until his death would set me free. Now he has got his well-merited punishments. Snow White married him, and Rose Red, his brother, and they divided the great treasure the dwarf had collected in his cave between them. 
The old mother, mother lived for many years peacefully with her children, and she carried the two roses trees with her, and they stood in front of her window, and every year they bore the finest red and white roses. Let's see. Okay. Keep going. <clears throat> Toads and Diamonds There was once upon a time a widow who had two daughters. The eldest was so much like her in the face and the humor that whoever looked upon the daughter saw the mother. They were both so disagreeable and so proud that there was no living with them. The youngest, who was the very picture of her father for courtesy and sweetness of temper, was withal one of the most beautiful girls ever seen. As people naturally love their own likenesses, this mother even doted on her eldest daughter, at the same time had a horrible aversion to the youngest. She made her eat in the kitchen and work continually. Among other things, this poor child was forced twice a day to draw water above a mile and a half off the house, and bring home a pitcher full of it. One day, as she was at this fountain, there came a poor woman who begged her to let her drink. Ah, aye, with all my heart, goody, said this pretty little girl, and rinsing immediately the pitcher, she took up some water from the clearest place of the fountain and gave it to her, holding up the pitcher all the while that the, she might drink the easier. The good woman, having drunk, said to her, You are very pretty, my dear, so good and so mannerly that I cannot help giving you a gift. For this was a fairy who had taken the form of a poor countrywoman, to see how far the civility and good manners of this pretty girl would go. I will give you a gift, continued the fairy, that at every word you speak... There shall come out of your mouth either a flower or a jewel. It's not a great blessing. When the pretty girl came home, her mother scolded her for staying so long at the fountain. I beg your pardon, Mama, said the poor girl, for not making more haste. And in speaking these words, there came out of her mouth two roses, two pearls, and two diamonds. "'What is it I see here?' said the mother, quite astonished. "'I think I see pearls and diamonds coming out of your girl's mouth. "'How happens this, child?' "'That was the first time she had ever called her child. "'The poor creature told her frankly all of the matter, "'not without dropping her infinite numbers of diamonds.' In good faith, cried the mother, I must send my child thither. Come hither, Fanny. Look what comes out of thy sister's mouth when she speaks. Wouldst thou be glad, my dear, to have the same gift given thee? Thou hast nothing else to do but go and draw water out of the fountain, and when a certain poor woman asks you to let her drink, to give it to her all civilly. That would be very fair indeed, said this ill-bred minx, to see me go draw water. You shall go, you hussy, said the mother, and this minute. <laughs> so away she went, but grumbling all the way, and taking with her the best silver tankard in the house. No sooner was she at the fountain when she saw, coming out of the wood, the lady most gloriously dressed, who came up to her and asked to drink. This was, you must know, the very fairy who appeared to her sister. 
but now had taken the air and dress of a princess to see how far this girl's rudeness would go. I am come hither, said the proud saucy one, to serve you with water. Pray, I suppose the silver tankard was brought purely for your ladyship, was it? However, you may drink out of it, if you have a fancy. You are not over and above mannerly, answered the fairy, without putting yourself in a passion. Well, then, since you have so little breeding and are so disobliging, I shall give you the gift that every word you speak shall come out of your mouth as a snake or a toad. As soon as her mother saw her coming, she cried out, Well, daughter? Well, mother, answered the pert hussy, throwing out her mouth two vipers and two toads. Oh, mercy, <laughs> cried the mother. What is it I see? Oh, is it that wretch, her sister, who has occasioned all this? But she shall pay for it. And immediately she ran to beat her. The poor child fled away from her and went to hide herself in the forest, not far from thence. The king's son, then on his return from hunting, met her, and seeing her so very pretty, asked her what she did before being out there all alone, and why she cried. Alas, sir, my mamma has turned at me out of doors. The king's son, who saw five or six pearls and as many diamonds come out of her mouth, desired her to tell him how it happened. She thereupon told him the whole story, and so the king's son fell in love with her, considering himself that such a gift was worth more than any marriage portion, conducted her to the palace, the king, his father, and then married her. As for the sister, she made herself so much hatred that her own mother turned her off, and the miserable wretch, having wandered about a good while without finding anybody to take her in, went to a corner of the wood, and there died. That's what happens when you have vipers for a time. Do, 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 do. Okay, this story is a lot longer. Fifteen pages, so bad. I know I've read this one before. <clears throat> Prince Darling. Once upon a time, there lived a king who was so just and kind that his subjects called him the Good King. It happened one day, when he was out hunting, that a little white rabbit, which his dogs were chasing, sprang into his arms for shelter. He stroked it gently and said to it, Well, bunny, as you have come to me for protection, I will see that nobody hurts you. And he took it home to his palace, and had it put in a pretty little house, with all sorts of nice things to eat. That night, when he was all alone in his room, a beautiful lady suddenly appeared before him. Her long dress was as white as the snow, and she had a crown of white roses upon her head. The good king was very much surprised to see her, for he knew his door had been tightly shut, and he could not think how she had gotten in. But she said to him, I am the fairy Truth. I was passing through the wood when you were out hunting, and I wished to find out if you were really good as everybody said you were. So I took the shape of a little rabbit and came to your arms for shelter, for I know that those who are merciful to animals will be still kinder to their fellow men. If you had refused to help me, 
I should have been certain that you were wicked. I thank you for the kindness you have shown me, which has made me your friend forever. You have only to ask me for anything you want, and I promise that I will give it to you. Madam, said the good king, since you are a fairy, you no doubt know all my wishes. I have but one son whom I love very dearly. That is why we call him Prince Darling. If you are really good enough to wish me to do a favor, I beg that you will become his friend. With all my heart, answered the fairy, I can make your son the handsomest prince in the world, or the richest, or the most powerful. Choose whichever you like for him. I do not ask either of those things for my son, replied the king. But if you will make him the best of princes, I shall indeed be grateful to you. What good would it be to do him riches, or to be handsome, or possess all the kingdoms of the world, if he were wicked? You know well he would still be unhappy. Only a good man can be really contented. You are quite right, answered the fairy, but it is not my power to make Prince Darling a good man unless he will help me. He must himself try hard to become good. I can only promise to give him good advice, to scold him for his faults, and to punish him if he will not correct and punish himself. The good king was quite satisfied with his promise, and very soon after, he died. Prince Darling was very sad, for he loved his father with all his heart, and he would willingly have given all the kingdoms and all the treasures and gold and silver if they could have kept his good father with him. Two days afterward, the prince had gone to bed, the fairy suddenly appeared to him and said, I promised your father that I would be your friend, and to keep my word I have come to bring you a present. At the same time, she put a little gold ring on his finger. Take good care of this ring, she said. It is more precious than diamonds. Every time you do a bad deed, it will prick your finger. But if, in spite of its pricking, you go on in your own evil way, you will lose my friendship, and I shall become your enemy. So saying, the fairy disappeared, leaving Prince Darling very much astonished. For some time he behaved well that the ring never pricked him, and that made him contented with that all his subjects called him Prince Darling the Happy. One day, however, he went out hunting, but could get no sports, which put him in a very bad temper. It seemed to him as he rode along that his ring was pressing into his finger, but as it did not prick, he did not heed it. When he got home and went to his room, his little dog Bibby ran to, over to him greet him, jumping around with great pleasure. "'Get away,' said the prince, quite gruffly. "'I don't want you. You're in my way.' The poor little dog, who didn't understand this at all, pulled at his coat and made him at least look at her, and this made the prince so cross that he gave her quite a hard kick. Instantly the ring pricked him sharply, as if it had been a pin. He was very much surprised and sat down in a corner of his room, feeling quite ashamed of himself. I believe the fairy is laughing at me, he thought. Surely I could have done no great wrong in just kicking a tiresome animal. What is the good of my being ruler of a great kingdom if I am not allowed to beat my own dog? I am not making fun of you, said a voice, answering Prince Darling's thoughts. You have committed three faults. First of all, you were out of temper because you could not have what you wanted. And you thought all men and animals were only made to do your pleasure. Then you were really angry, which is very naughty indeed. 
And lastly, you were cruel to the poor little animal, who did not in the least deserve to be ill-treated. I know you are far above the little dog, but if it is right and allowable that great people should ill-treat all those that are beneath them, I might at this moment beat you or kill you. For a fairy is greater than a man. The advantage of possessing a great empire is not to be able to do evil that one desires, but to do all the good that one possibly can. The prince saw how naughty he had been, and promised to try to do better in the future, but he did not keep his word. In fact, he had been brought up by a foolish nurse, who had spoiled him when he was little. If he wanted anything, he only had to cry and fret and stamp his feet, and she would give him whatever he asked for, which had, in fact, made him self-willed. Also, she had told him from morning to night that he would one day be a king, and that kings were very happy, because everyone they was bound to obey and respect them, and no one could prevent them from doing just as they liked. Uh, sounds familiar. When the prince grew old enough to understand, he soon learned that there could be nothing worse than to be proud, obstinate, and conceited, and he had really tried to cure himself of these defects. But by that time, all his fonts had become habits, and a bad habit is very hard to get rid of. Not that he was naturally of a bad disposition. He was truly sorry when he had been naughty, and said, I am very unhappy to have to struggle against my anger and pride every day. If I had been punished for them when I was little, there would not be such trouble to me now. The ring pricked him very often, and sometimes he left off what he was doing at once, but at other times he would not attend to it. Strangely enough, it only gave him a slight prick for a trifling fault. But then he was really naughty, it made his finger actually bleed. At last he got tired of being continually reminded and warned, wanted to be able to do as he liked. So he threw the ring aside and thought himself the happiest of men to got rid of the treasuring picks. He gave himself up for doing every foolish thing that occurred to him, until he became quite wicked and nobody would like him any longer. One day, when the prince was walking about, he saw a young girl, who was so very pretty that he made up his mind at once he would marry her. Her name was Celia, and she was as good as she was beautiful. Prince Darling fancied that Celia would think herself only too happy if he offered to make her a great queen, but she said fearlessly, Sire, I am only a shepherdess and a poor girl, but nevertheless, I will not marry you. Do you dislike me? asked the prince, who was very much vexed at this answer. No, my prince, replied Sila. I cannot help thinking you very handsome, but what good would riches be to me, and all the grand dresses and splendid carriages that you would give me, if bad deeds of which I see you do every day made me hate you and despise you. The prince was very angry at the speech and commanded his officers to make Celia a prisoner and carry her off to the palace. All day long, the remembrance of what she had said annoyed him, but he loved her. He could not make up his mind to have her punished. One of the prince's favorite companions was his foster brother, whom he trusted entirely. But he was not at all a good man, and gave Prince Darling very bad advice, and encouraged him in all his evil ways. When he saw the prince so downcast, and asked what the matter, when he explained that he could not bear Celia's bad opinion of him, and was resolved to be a better man in order to please her, the evil adviser said to him, 
You are very kind to trouble yourself about this little girl. If I were you, I would soon make her obey me. Remember that you are a king, and that it would be laughable to see you trying to please a shepherdess, who ought to be only be too glad to be one of your slaves. Keep her in prison, and feed her on bread and water for a little while. And then, if she still says she will not marry you, have her head cut off, to teach other people that you mean to be obeyed. Why, if you cannot make a girl that like that do as you wish, your subjects will soon forget that they are only part of this world and in your pleasure. <coughs> but, said Prince Darling, would it not be a shame if I had an innocent girl put to death? For Celia has done nothing to deserve punishment. If people will not do as you tell them, they ought to suffer for it, answered his foster brother. But even if you were unjust, you had better be accused of that your subjects than that they should find out that they may insult and thwart you as often as they please. And saying this, he was touching a weak point in his brother's character. For the prince's fear of losing any of his power made him at once abandon his first idea of trying to be good, and resolve to try and frighten the shepherdess into consenting to marry him. His foster brother, who wanted him to keep his resolution, invited three young courtiers, as wicked as himself, to sup with the prince and they persuaded him to drink a great deal of wine, and continued to excite his anger against Celia by telling him that she had laughed at his love for her, until at last, in quite a furious rage, he rushed off to find her, declaring that if she still refused to marry him, she should be sold as a slave the very next day. But when he reached the room in which Celia had been locked up, he was greatly surprised to find that she was not in it, although he had the key in his own pocket all the time. His anger was terrible, and he vowed vengeance against whoever had helped her to escape. His bad friends, when they heard him, resolved to turn his wrath upon an old nobleman who had formerly been his tutor and who still dared sometimes to tell the prince of his faults, for he loved him as if he had been his own son. At first Prince Darling had thanked him, but after a time he grew impatient and thought that it must be just mere love of fault-finding that made the old tutor blame him when everything else was praising and flattering him. So he ordered him to retire from his court, though he still, from time to time, spoke of him as a worthy man whom he respected, even if he no longer loved him. His unworthy friends feared that he might some day take it into his head to recall his old tutor, or they thought they now had a good opportunity of getting him banished forever. They reported to the prince that Suleiman, for that was the tutor's name, had boasted of having helped Celia to escape, and they bribed three men to say that Suleiman himself had told them about it. The prince, in great anger, sent his foster brother with a number of soldiers to bring his tutor before him, in chains like a criminal. After giving the order, he went to his own room, but he had scarcely got into it when there was a clap of thunder which made the ground shake, and the fairy truth appeared suddenly before him. I promised your father, she said sternly, to give you good advice and to punish you if you refuse to follow it. You have despised my counsel and have gone your own evil way until you are outly, only outly a man. You are a monster, the horror of everyone who knows you. It is time that I should fulfill my promise and begin your punishments. I condemn you to resemble the animal whose ways you have imitated. 
You have made yourself a lion by your anger, and like a wolf by your greediness. Wait a minute. Like a snake, you have ungratefully turned upon one who was a second father to you. Your curlishness has made you like a bull. Therefore, in your new form, take the appearance of all these animals. The fairy had scarcely finished speaking when Prince Darling saw to his horror that her words were fulfilled. He had a lion's head, a bull's horns, a wolf's feet, and a snake's body. At the same instant, he found himself in a great forest beside a clear lake, in which he could plainly see the horrible creature he had become. And a voice said to him, Look carefully at the state to which your wickedness has brought you. Believe me, your soul is a thousand times more hideous than your body. Prince Starling recognized the voice of Fairy Truth and turned to the fairy to catch her and eat her up as if he possibly could. But he saw no one, and the same voice went on. I laugh at your powerlessness and anger, and I intend to punish your pride by letting you fall into the hands of your own subjects. The prince began to think that the best thing he could do would be to get as far away from the lake as he could. Then at least he could not continually be reminded of his terrible ugliness. So he ran towards the wood. But before he had gone many yards, he fell into a deep pit which had been made to trap bears. And the hunters, who were hiding in a tree, leaped down and secured him with several chains and led him to the chief city of his own kingdom. On the way, instead of recognizing that his own faults had brought this punishment upon him, he accused the fairy of being the cause of all his misfortunes, and bit and tore at his chains ferociously. As they approached the town, he saw that some great rejoicing was being held, and while the hunters asked what had happened, they were told that the prince, whose only pleasure was to torment his people, had now been found in his room, killed by a thunderbolt, for that was what supposedly had to happen to become of him. Four of his courtiers, those who had encouraged him in his wicked doings, had tried to seize the kingdom and divide it between them. But the people, who knew it was their bad counsel which had changed the prince, had cut off their heads. Good job. And offered the crown to Suleiman, whom the prince had left in prison. This noble lord had just been crowned, and the deliverance of the kingdom was the cause of the rejoicing. For, they said, he is a good man and a just man, and while she will ha and we shall once more enjoy peace and prosperity. Prince Darling roared with anger when he heard this, but it was still worse for him when he reached the great square before his own palace. He saw Suleiman seated on a magnificent throne, and all people crowded around, wishing him a long life that he might undo all the mischief done by his predecessor. Presently Suleiman made a sign with his hand that the people should be silent, and said, I have accepted the crown you have offered me, but only that I might keep it for Prince Darling, who is not dead as you suppose. The fairy assured me that there is still hope that you may some day see him again. Good and virtuous as he was when he first came to the throne. Alas, he continued, he was led astray by flatterers. I knew his heart, and am certain that if it had not been for the bad influence of those who surrounded him, he would have been a good king and his father to the people. We may hate his faults, but let us pity him and hope for his restoration. As for me, I would die gladly if that could bring back our prince to reign justly and worthily again. These words went to Prince Starling's heart. He realized the true affection and faithfulness of his old tutor, 
and for the first time reproached himself for all his evil deeds. At the same time, he felt all of his anger melting away, and he began to think over his past life, and to admit that his punishment was not more than he had deserved. He left off tearing at the iron bars of his cage, in which he was still shut up, and became as gentle as a lamb. The hunters who caught him took him at a great menagerie, where he was chained up among all other wild beasts, and he determined to show his sorrow for his past bad behavior by being gentle and obedient to the man who would take care of him. Unfortunately, this man was very rough and unkind, and though the poor monster was quite quiet, he often beat him without rhyme or reason when he happened to be in a bad temper. One day, when this keeper was asleep, a tiger broke its chain and flew at him to eat him. Prince Darling, who saw what was going on, at first felt quite pleased to think that he should be delivered from his persecution, but soon thought better of it and wished that he were free. I would return good for evil, he said to himself, and save the unhappy man's life. When he had hardly wished this, when his iron cage flew open, and he rushed to the side of the keeper, who was awake and was defending himself against the tiger. When he saw the monster had got out, he gave himself up for lost, but his fear was soon changed into joy, for the kind monster threw itself upon the tiger and very soon killed it and then came and crouched at the feet of the man it had saved. Overcome with gratitude, the keeper stooped to caress the strange creature, which had done him such a great service, but suddenly a voice in his ear. A good action should never go unrewarded. And at that, the same instant the monster disappeared, and he saw at his feet only a pretty little dog. Prince Darling, delighted by the change, frisked about the man, showing his joy in every way he could. The man, taking him up in his arms, carried him to the king, to whom he told the whole story. The queen said she would like to have this wonderful little dog, and the prince would have been very happy in his new home, if he could not have forgotten that he was a man and a king. The queen petted and took care of him, but she was so afraid that he would get too fat that she consulted the court physician, who said that he was only to be fed upon bread, and was not to have much even of that. Soon, poor Prince Darling was terribly hungry all day long, but he was very patient about it. One day, when they gave him a little loaf for breakfast, he thought he would like to eat it out of the garden, so he took it out in his mouth and trotted away towards the brook, where he knew a long way from the palace. When he was surprised to find that the brook was gone, and where it now stood a great house that seemed to be built of gold and precious stones. A number of people splendidly dressed were going in, and the music and dancing and feasting could be heard from all the windows. But what seemed very strange was that those people who came out of the house were pale and thin, and their clothes were torn, and rags hanging on them. Some fell down dead as they came out before they had time to get away. Others crawled farther with great difficulty, while others again lay on the ground, fainting with hunger, and begged a morsel of bread from those who were going into the house but they would not so much as look at the poor creatures. Prince Darling went up to a young girl who was trying to eat a few blades of grass as she was so hungry. Touched by the compassion, he said to himself, I am very hungry, but I shall not die of starvation before I get my dinner. If I give my breakfast to this poor creature, perhaps I may save her life. So he laid the piece of bread at the girl's head, and he saw her eat it up eagerly. She soon seemed to be quite well again, and the prince, delighted to have been able to help her, was thinking of going in home to the palace, 
when he heard a great outcry, and turning around saw Celia, who was being carried away by into the great house. For the first time, the prince regretted that he was no longer a monster. Then he would be able to rescue Celia. Now he could only bark feebly at the people who were carrying her off, and try to follow them. But they chased and kicked him away. He determined not to quit till the quit the place till he knew that it had become of Celia, and blamed himself for what had befallen her. Alas, he said to himself, I am furious with the people who are carrying off Celia, but it isn't exactly what I did myself. If I had been prevented, I did not intend to be still more cruel to her. There he was interpreted by a noise above his head. Someone was opening a window, and he saw with delight that it was Celia herself, who came forward and threw out a plate of the most delicious-looking food. Then the window was shut again. And Prince Darling, who had not had anything to eat all day, thought he might as well take the opportunity to get something. He ran forward to begin, but the young girl to whom he had given his bread gave a cry in terror, and took him up in her arms, saying, "'Don't touch it, my poor little dog. The house is a palace of pleasure, and everything that comes out of it is poisoned.' At the same moment, the voice said, "'You see, a good action always brings its reward.' And the prince found himself changing into a beautiful white dove. He remembered that white was the favorite color of the fairy truth, and began to hope that he might at last win back her favor. But just now his first care was for Celia, and rising into the air he flew around and around the house until he saw an open window, but he searched through every room in vain. No trace of Celia. And the prince, in despair, determined to search through the world until he found her. He flew on and on for several days, till he came to a great desert, where he saw a cavern, and to his delight there sat Celia, sharing a simple breakfast of an old hermit. Overjoyed to have found her, Prince Darling perched upon her shoulder, trying to express by his caress how glad he was to see her again. And Celia, surprised and delighted by the tameness of this pretty white dove, stroked it softly and said, though she never thought of its understanding her. I accept the gift that you make of yourself, and I will love you always. Take care what you are saying, Celia, said the old hermit. Are you prepared to keep that promise? Indeed, I hope so, my sweet... Indeed, I hope so, my sweet shepherdess, cried the prince, who was at that moment restored to his natural shape. You promised to love me always. Tell me that you really meant what you said, or that I shall have to ask the fairy to give back my form of the dove which pleased you so much. <laughs> you need not be afraid that she will change her mind, said the fairy, throwing off the hermit's robe, in which she had disguised and appearing before them. Celia has loved you ever since she first saw you, only she would not tell you while you were so obstinate and naughty. Now you have repented and mean to be good, deserve to be happy, and so she may love you as much as she likes. Celia and Prince Darling threw themselves at the fairy's feet. And the prince was never tried of thanking her for her kindness. Celia was delighted to hear how sorry he was for the past follies and misdeeds, and promised to love him as long as she lived. Rise, my children, said the fairy, and I shall transport you to the palace, and Prince Darling shall have back again the crown he forfeited by his bad behavior. While she was speaking, they found themselves in Suleiman's hall, and his great delight was seeing his dear master once more. He gave up the throne joyfully to the prince, 
and remained always as faithful as the subjects. Celia and Prince Darling reigned for many years, but he was so determined to govern worthily and to do his duty that his ring, which he took to wearing again, never once pricked him severely. <clears throat> All right, everyone. Uh, that should be the last tale for the night. Uh, do try to keep to that two-hour line, and that was a bit longer story. So, I hope you enjoyed listening to these stories. Again, I'll have those up on YouTube as soon as I can, anyway. Now, ooh, Clover's on. If anyone doesn't know Clover, I will see if I can do the shout out to her. Ah, my typing is horrible at this range. Clover. Mimicry. <laughs> she is writing right now, which is good because I will eventually try to do a recording of the novel that she gave me a read, but <clears throat> it was difficult for me to read, I'll admit it. Let me try the regular shout out, see what, ah, cooperate keyboard. Out, out, clover, mimicry. Because this will pop up on our stream, I'm kind of curious if it will. Boop. Oh, the channel I am chatting at is not exist. Did I type something wrong? Yes, I did. Okay. Shout out Clover underscore Mimicree. And there we go. Uh, again, she's an author. She does play games. Go give her a follow. And as I said, we were going to read her. I will put up my read message because I finally got around to making one. This is a second, like, story wolf, right? Okay. So, I've made Clover Mimicry. <sighs> Keep hitting that shift thing. Okay. I put the channel just. Now maybe? Okay. So yeah. Uh, thank you everyone for coming by. Uh, glad you're able to make it in Shizu. And uh... Hope you get some good rest, and I uh, will see you floating around on Twitter. <laughs> Have a good night. I'll probably be awake for another few hours, weekends. I don't know. I've got more stories to record. <laughs> so anyway, uh, go check on Clover. <laughs>